If they're ever not excited, I'm worried. <laughs> It'd be, wouldn't that be so much worse if we said, super kids, you're dismissed, and they're like, oh, but they go off happy. So that is awesome. Um, all right, before we get started, uh, if you want to turn to Acts 18, awesome, go for it. That's where we're going to pick up. But I just want to say to everyone here, I know we covered it in announcements, but I want to make sure we're talking to the people at home online uh, to let you know that this Wednesday is a special service. Normally, Wednesday is when we do our youth service, and that we'll have uh, some games, worship, uh, and then a teaching time. This Wednesday, we're inviting anyone who would like just to come experience a time of worship. It's, it's going to be worship and scripture and testimony and prayer, uh, what that looks like. We've done this kind of service a few times before, traditionally on Sunday mornings, and this time we're going to do it on a Wednesday night and invite anybody, all uh, other churches, your friends, your family, uh, and you, specifically you, are invited. We would like you to come join us. Guys, this is just a time where we do. We put the sole focus on the, the glory of God, inviting him to move amongst us as he sees fit. This is really an Acts 2 kind of thing where we all just gather together in one accord, praying, uplifting his name, and saying, God, whatever you want. Um, there's no specific end time on this. Uh, it could be 7 to 8 p.m., but we're not going to say, you know, well, God, it's 8 p.m., so we got to really, um, we don't do that. So uh, whatever God wants to do, he's going to do. We've got it uh, nice and in order, and he can interrupt it however he sees fit. So, um, so we, we really do. We invite you to that this Wednesday. We hope you can make it and invite friends, family, uh, bring them. It will be a good time. So now... We go to Acts 18, and we remember where we were last week, where we saw Paul in Corinth, where he was preaching and discipling and facing opposition from people that claim to be on God's side but are anything but. And he stayed there for a year and a half because God wanted him to, and now it's time for Paul to move on. God told him to go to the Gentiles, that he would be a witness to Jesus, to governors and kings, and that can't happen if he stays in Corinth, so he goes. How many of you know sometimes it's just easier to stay put in the place where you're like, I've been having a good time, we're settled, we're happy. Paul had really carved out a good life for himself in Corinth. He was, he was happy, things were going good. Um, God had told him, there's a lot of people that, that are called by my name, that are on your side, that are with you here in Corinth. And it would have been the easiest thing in the world for Paul to be like, I'm gonna put up roots here. This is where I'm gonna to, you know, set my home base, my church, and we're gonna go for it. But uh, God had other plans for Paul. Yours might be to put down roots. Yours might be to go elsewhere. Be open to what God has for you and just know that wherever he has for you, it's, it's good and it's also to the glory of his kingdom. Um, we're going to look at that in, in detail about a couple people, uh, some who were called to go, some who were called to stay today. And all of it ties back to people knowing Jesus. Um, Acts 18, 18. Paul uh, stayed in Corinth, on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Centrea because of a vow he had taken. Uh, this was most likely the Nazarite vow made by Jews in number six who wanted to dedicate themselves to God. Uh, it involved letting her hair grow out and not drinking any wine, not touching dead things, etc. Uh, I'm not going to go into this now, but it will be important later. Uh, we're going to cover what that meant uh, in a very future service, either next week or the week after. I just want us to note that his fellow tent makers, remember we talked about them, Priscilla and Aquila, they came with Paul. Their home had been in Corinth. 
They were there before Paul got there. They were established. They had friends and neighbors. And when Paul got there, uh, they found out, oh, you're a tent maker too? And so he goes and stays with the tent makers. And then he tells them all about Jesus. And then they get all excited about Jesus. And they're a part of the local Corinth church there. And when it comes time for Paul to leave, they say, we'll go with you. That's a powerful thing, right? And it's, it's very important what happens next. Because it kind of throws us. Um, verse 19. They arrived at Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. So Paul is at Ephesus, and that's a big deal. Uh, remember back in Acts 16, when Paul tries to go preach the gospel in Asia and God said no. He said no more than once. Uh, it wasn't a forever no, it was a not yet no. It was a waiting for God's timing no. Think about that for a second. What was Paul's original mission? What, what, was, what was he called to do? If we go all the way back to Acts 13, feels, feels like a long way back, a bunch of people were gathered together, these elders, these members of Paul's church, and they sought out the will of God. And they said, God, what would you have us do? All we want is what you want. We just want to be in the service of your kingdom. And they call out uh, Paul and Barnabas, and they say, you're going to go preach to the Gentiles. You're going to go out there. You're going to start church planning. You're going to start spreading the kingdom in all these places that haven't heard about Jesus. So that was the mission. And so when Paul gets to a place that seems like this qualifies, when he gets to the province of Asia, he's at the border and he gets told no, twice. The Holy Spirit sent Paul out, but then he got to this one place and the Holy Spirit said, not yet. And when uh, it made sense, in, in Paul's rationale, it would have made sense for Paul to do this thing. That's what he's supposed to do, but God says no. Have you ever gotten a no from God before? Yeah. Um, especially when you're like, I don't, I don't understand. I feel like I'm supposed to be doing this. I, I feel like this is, this is part of, of what you would have me do. And God is very clearly like, not yet. Acts 16, 17 says, they tried to go into Asia, but the spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. But two chapters later, Paul steps into Asia, which is where Ephesus is. I believe even now, even now, God has put things on your hearts that you long to do, whether it be a, a business or a new career or getting married or having children or buying a house, or moving, or furthering your education, whatever it might be. God put it on Paul's heart to go. But then he put up a roadblock at Asia. And he said, not yet. That's not for you yet. I'm going to get you there, but in my timing, not yours. The amount of times that I have gotten ahead of God. A great example is I did ministry for many, many years down in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I was an associate pastor for 13 years at a place called The Life Connection um, that I love very much. And it was a, a very large church. And we got up here and um, we felt the call of God on our life. We really did. We, we felt God say, you're to come up here and you're to do what I would have you called to do. To me... I felt very much like, well, that's obviously I'm supposed to step into the role of senior pastor very quickly. And I came up here and there was, ooh, guys, there was pride. There was 100% pride of just, I know more. I know how to do this. I've been a part of a big church. I can do this, no problem. Uh, other people just step aside and I'll, I'll take it. Um, and God, in his infinite wisdom and mercy and grace, put up roadblocks for me in my life. And... I didn't understand. I, I had gotten to the border and I'm like, okay, I'm here, God. I'm ready to do the thing you would have me do. And God said, not yet. <laughs> not yet. No. 
And I can tell you the stuff that God prepared me for, that if I had become a senior pastor back then, I could tell you I just would have broke. I would have come across some of the obstacles um, that I saw this church face, uh, and I just would have been like, mm, no. God was preparing my heart, preparing me to be at a place where I could infinitely trust him and lay down pride and say, this, this has not nor ever will be about me, but is wholly about God and what he would have. Now, I'm not saying that's Paul's lesson or what was happening, but I am saying that there was a whole bunch of preparation that was being made for Paul. Because when Paul got to Asia there in 16, he hadn't gone through a whole bunch of trials yet. He had already seen some stuff. He hasn't even begun to see the worst of it. And remember, this is a guy that's been drug out of a street and stoned to death and then got up and went back into the, into the town. Um, Paul's seen some stuff. He's been jailed, beaten, stoned. He's seen some stuff. And God said, you're not ready for Ephesus yet. I'm still preparing you. I'm still doing a work. And I'm also laying groundwork in Ephesus so that they are ready to hear. They are ready to re receive. Boy, we have to be so understanding and, and faithful and trusting to God's timing for those things that he's laid on our hearts and not get ahead of ourselves. Guys, I understand the call. I understand. I believe the desires of your heart. God put them there. He put them there. But there are times where he will say, not yet. It's his plan. It's his timing. He's going to work it out. You just have to trust him. Uh, I was at, at Pilot Travel Center for a very long time, for nine years, and I asked God to go more than once. Please release me. Let me out of that place. And time and time again, not yet, not yet, not yet. I'll never forget the time. It was three months before I started uh, my new job where I felt a release. I wasn't even looking for it. I just shared the gospel with someone I knew I was supposed to share the gospel to. And then I felt God very clearly say, that was the last one. And I'm like, and I just felt like this. I can't other, otherwise describe it as anything but like a... a a release, like a weight was lifted off and just a go, go now to the next place. That's, I firmly believe, Paul has that now with Ephesus. He'd been told no, and now it's like, oh, I'm good in Corinth. I was established in Corinth, but Ephesus is calling. The, the thing that God put on my, part, on my heart to keep going to the Gentiles, to keep going to these places, God has continually moved in him. He's done what he's called to do. He's leaving it in trusted hands, and he is going, and he is moving out into Ephesus. Is it easy to wait on God for that call? No. No, it is not, because it denies our flesh. Our flesh wants right now especially in our society. We are an on-demand society. Why did I have to wait 30 seconds for the microwave to do that? Ah! We, we want what we want, and we want it right now, all the time, right now. Waiting on God, though, requires faith and patience and trust that God's ways are best and that he moves when it's time to move. God had me wait seven years to become a senior pastor when we moved up here. And I wouldn't have moved a second sooner in my spirit. In fact, when I got the call to be a senior pastor, my first reaction after waiting uh, so long was, no, no, thank you. Uh, I have seen, I've seen what it is. I've seen what it demands, what it requires. But God was again patient with me and we trusted him. And he saw us through that too. I talked to someone earlier just this week who said they'd given up on praying and trusting God for answers to their problems because God so often didn't answer their prayers the way they wanted them to. Sometimes we have to realize that the answer to that prayer is going to have you wait and keep praying and keep trusting 
and allow ourselves to keep growing closer to God so that when the time comes to go to Ephesus or to start that business or to further your education or get married or have kids, whatever it is God is laying on your heart to do, you are ready for the obstacles and the hardships that may come. And it will not break you because your feet are on the rock. Before Ephesus, Paul had been strengthened and refined in fire through beatings, stoning, prison, and people saying mean, mean things. And God opens the door to Asia. Are you allowing God to prepare you today to mold you for the plans that he has in store for you? Or are you resisting and want to give up? Remember what James said in James 1 verse 2, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. It's easier for you to say, James, but if we recall, he was saying this to a church in Jerusalem that was under constant persecution, imprisonment, uh, of, and, and beatings of all kinds. And he says, consider it pure joy because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. As Christians, if you feel like you're in the middle of a trial right now, let your faith in God increase. Let the church, let the brothers and sisters that stand with you, let them pray over you, let them strengthen and disciple you, but don't give up. Don't withdraw. That's our go-to thing. Since the garden, we want to withdraw. Things get hard and we say, nope, 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 it's my problem. I'll deal with it. I'll handle it. Everybody else stay away and we create a wall. We create a barrier around ourselves and that just makes it harder for ourselves. We are to lean on one another. We are to allow each other to hold up each other's arms. And we're to consider the testing. This is hard. Consider the testing pure joy. And let it produce faith that perseveres so that you can become mature followers of Christ that God would have you be. This is a problem that many churches face. We have a bunch of teenage Christians instead of mature Christians. And I say that no disrespect, <laughs> no disrespect to our teenagers because our teenagers, I have watched them mature in the faith as they have come to youth group, as they have put in the word, as they have done service for the kingdom. I've seen them mature. They're going to face new hardships and testing and they have to stay mature because a lot of us, we want to, we want to have that teenage mindset in our faith, where we go, this is hard. I don't like it. I don't like it, God. Uh, I'm going to go to my room, and I'm going to have a pity party, and I'm not actually going to mature or trust God. I'm just going to withdraw, and I'm going to, to try and, and just understand, why can't I do it now? Why can't I do it my way? Why can't I just trust myself? And it's never going to work how we want it to. It's never going to be as good as letting God have his way, doing it his way and his timing. Got very excited there. Verse 20. Hmm. Paul is, uh, we see Paul reasoning with the Jews there about the gospel. That's where we pick up verse 20. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. Then he set sail from Ephesus. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. Now, a lot just happened there in a, in a very short period of time. Paul just got to Ephesus. Priscilla and Aquila dropped everything, went with Paul to Ephesus. And then Paul's like... Everybody here needs to know Jesus. All right, peace. I got to go. And he takes off. Um, he's going to come back, but he's leaving in order to fulfill that vow that they talked about earlier. He had to go back to Jerusalem. The, the Nazarite vow that he was under um, had to be completed there. Uh, again, we'll look at that further here very soon. But right now, verse 23. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. 
That's something we've seen Paul do again and again, right? Uh, it's something that the people of God need to be so good at, need to excel in. When you come to church or men's group or, or women's group or youth group or gals being pals or sit down, whatever it is, whatever it is, wherever you're sitting down to read the Bible, pray together. Prepare to strengthen each other like Paul, constantly going into churches. Uh, when he comes back, he goes to these places more than once. He sends them letters more than once. He reminds them of the goodness of God, of the promise of God, of the gospel, of our need to love one another, our need to make disciples, to confess to one another, to be in the word over and over again. And that's what the church is called to do and still does for one another. Like I've said before, sometimes you come into this place, I get it, I get it, on a Sunday morning, and you don't feel like singing about the goodness of God. And you don't feel like opening your Bible and reading a passage of scripture that talks about you might have to wait. We don't, our flesh hates those kind of things. It's like, ah, I don't want to. Life is dumb right now. I don't like it. I don't want to lift my hands. I don't want to praise his name. I don't want to talk about his goodness and his mercy and how much he's given me over and over again and how patient he's been with me, how good he is all the time, how he never leaves me or forsakes me. Guys, I can't begin to tell you how many times I have not necessarily wanted to be in the presence of God only to find out that that is the only thing I've needed. We have to, have to, have to do that and remind that to each other over and over again. That is how we strengthen the body. That is how we remind ourselves. And sometimes you're going to come in not wanting to be here. And you have to be willing just to let other people speak over you to help lift up your arms. And then, and then, when you've been strengthened, strengthen other people. If you're coming to church in constant need of, you're, it's all about me, it's all about me all the time, you're never going to experience the fullness of God because it is about loving God, loving people, making disciples. That's what it's about. That's, that's the big three commands. It's not about taking care of myself and then loving God and loving people and making disciples. You find that yourself gets taken care of as we put ourselves out there, as we surrender our hearts to God, as we make ourselves servants, as we declare the kingdom and we make disciples. All these things will be added unto us. Verse 24. I'm like halfway going with my notes today. I just, I'm like, I'm very excited. Uh, verse 24. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He'd been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. So this guy Apollos shows up on the scene. He's a young guy, he's a Jew, like Paul, and he's got a wealth of knowledge of the scriptures, like Paul. But whereas Paul has repeatedly said, he's like, I don't think I'm a good speaker. Uh, Apollos brings it. This guy gets up there, and he's spitting fire from the pulpit, speaks with great fervor, enthusiastically. He gets the people engaged, and it says, Apollos taught about Jesus accurately, and what he knew of Jesus, but unfortunately at that time, he didn't know much. He only knew about the baptism of John and our need to make straight our paths for the one that would come after John. Uh, he was telling people, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Turn from sin to God. So he's this dynamic preacher that is missing a very important piece of the gospel about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And those tent makers, Priscilla and Aquila, who left their home 
in Corinth to follow Paul to Ephesus, who then bounced and went back to Jerusalem. Um, they are there for such a time as this. Apollos knows of Jesus, but doesn't know Jesus. So Aquila and Priscilla are there in Corinth when Paul would have wrote Romans 10, verse 14. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. And so with that in mind, Priscilla and Aquila take this dynamic preacher into their home, and they explain to them in detail who Jesus is, what he did, what he is still doing, how he is a risen Savior, how he is returning, how he has sent us a helper, the Holy Spirit. And with this, Apollo really gets his preach on and ends up in Achaia, where uh, that is where Corinth is. And he waters what Paul sowed. Do you see how God's hand is at work through all this? how he's just connecting it all, how he's using two tent makers who didn't know about Jesus, who would come to know him very well through Paul and would follow Paul, and in doing so, would get a chance to instruct Apollos about Jesus as Messiah, and he would go back and strengthen and encourage the believers in Corinth that Paul cared so much about. Apollos would just layer upon the foundation that Paul had set. And Paul is very thankful for this, as he mentions Apollos very favorably in 1 Corinthians and in Titus. To Paul, Apollos is an answer to prayer. Because Paul knows he's just one guy. He's not God. He can't be everywhere at once. He can't be uh, everywhere with church planning and discipleship. So God is raising up leaders, spirit-filled leaders. If if they're leaders but they ain't spirit-filled, God's going to send some tent makers there to invite them in and fill the gaps. In my time of ministry, guys, I've had a lot of people say, well, you know, Josh, you're the pastor you're called to bring people into the church. You're, you're called to, to be the witness. You're called to, you know, uh, know all the scripture, tell all the people the stuff, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, no, no. I'm called to do those, yes. Uh, and you might not be called to preach, teach, or be a missionary, prophet, or evangelist. That might not be your calling. That's fine. But we are all called to be faithful to the call of God on our lives. And you might not do it with a microphone or in front of a bunch of people. Priscilla and Aquila didn't stand in front of an amphitheater full of people or in front of the synagogue. But when it came time, they invited someone into their home. And they instructed a preacher that God was going to send back to Corinth to continue the work that Paul started They shared with him the gospel. They they told him more about Jesus. That is something that we're all called to do. All of us. And if it's out of your comfort zone, I would say this. Stop caring about your comfort zone so much when it comes to the will of God. Because when it comes to our flesh, we don't want to wait, right? We want what we want when we want it now. But when it comes to the things of God, we're so often like, I'll put that on the back burner. They could have done that. Priscilla and Aquila could have been like, well, he seems like he's got that underhand. It seems like, it seems like, you know, his heart is in the right place. He loves, he clearly, he loves God. He just doesn't know Jesus. Priscilla and Aquila were like, man, we need to get that. We need to have lunch with that guy. We need to get him in here. We need to, we need to help open his eyes. 
Who are you strengthening in your life? Who are you discipling in your life today? Because if you are spirit-filled, you are called to strengthen and disciple someone right now, like Priscilla and Aquila did with Apollos. It might be over a meal. It might be over uh, a round of golf or a board game or during you're changing someone's oil. I don't know. I don't know what it is for you, but I do know that Priscilla and Aquila saw that something was missing in Apollos' teaching. And they invited him in and they said, would you like to know more? And we never do that alone. Remember, you're not alone in this. The Holy Spirit is there for all who believe. So now we step into Acts 19. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. So he's back. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, No, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. So Paul's back in Ephesus, and he finds these disciples. And and like Apollos, these people don't know about the saving power of Jesus. What they know is, is John, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, makes straight your paths. They've repented from sin, but they don't know who to turn to. They don't know who to follow. They need a Savior. They just don't know who he is. And Paul tells them about Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. And Paul told the people to believe in him. And they are, yes, they are 100% all in. Altar call given and received because it says in verse 5, and I love this. On hearing this, on hearing the name of Jesus, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Just like what happened in the house of Cornelius. As Peter begins to preach the gospel, Holy Spirit falls, everyone instantly saved, and then Paul lays hands on them. And the Holy Spirit manifests in their lives through tongues and prophecy all to the glory of God. I love how easy God makes relationship with him. Gone was the impossible law in the Old Testament where you had 600 and some statutes you had to follow. And boy, all the, th- all the different ways we could instantly become unclean and separated from God. And now we just, like these people, We hear about a God who loves us, who sent his only son, that so whoever believed in him would not perish but have eternal life. And they hear this, and they believe, and they are saved. They're saved. Their their sins, their debts, covered, paid for. Verse 8. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way, so Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. In a few chapters, we've gone from the Holy Spirit saying, no, not yet, to Asia, to right now in Acts 19, all of the Jews and Greeks that live in the Asian province hearing the gospel. Verse 11, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. 
That's very reminiscent of how, Paul, uh, how Peter's shadow was healing people as he walked by. Guys, let me tell you, I want this. I want you to want this. Not the, not the shadow or the handkerchief healing. That's nice. Um, that's cool. What I want, what I hope you want, is that as we walk by places, as we step into places that, that are, are darkness, uh, that are filled with darkness, that it becomes light where we go, that people know that's a person that is spending time with God. I don't want people to see me. I don't want them to see you. I want them to see the God that rests on and in us, that works through us. They can ignore me completely. Um, I want them to see the God that has my heart, see his holiness, see that this is a temple where he dwells. As we let those trials produce persevering faith, that's what happens. It stops being us. It stops being about us entirely, and it becomes God in and through us. Verse 13, some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. That's just another reference right there to knowing of Jesus and knowing Jesus. Those sons of Siva knew the name, but they didn't know Jesus as Lord. And so the evil spirit wasn't phased a bit. When we pray, are we calling on the name of Jesus like someone we've heard of in a book? Or are we calling out to our Lord, our Savior, our friend? Verse 17, when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believe now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I have been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. I remember God meeting me at camp when I was 16. I made him Lord during that week, and when I got back from camp, I took stock of certain things that were in my life that I knew were not bringing me closer to God. They were separating me from him. Music and, and movies. Um, no one said, Josh, get rid of those things. But in my heart, I knew I needed to. Whether I had made them a, a God unto myself or whether I had, uh, they were just filling me full of, of vileness and, and again, stuff that separates, that does not help me draw near. Um, and, and so I did, I, and that's not going to be the last time I did it. Uh, I'd go to ORU, and it's amazing how much stuff can build up. Um, this is why the Jewish Festival of Unleavened Bread, every year they had a time where they're like, what's been allowed to build up? What sin has allowed to creep into your life? And they would go, and they would get the yeast, and they would sweep out all the yeast, symbolically saying, whatever, whatever sin that I've allowed to to pile up, I, I'm choosing right now to get rid of it. I'm laying aside bad habits. I'm laying aside uh, things that I've tried to, to make an idol or put over God. I want to get rid of that. And Ephesus goes through this. They clean house. They get rid of evil scrolls. They get rid of idols. They get rid of all this kind of stuff. And I challenge you, look at your life right now. Look at your life and say, have moments where this happens, not just 
uh, today, but I mean, you might have to six months from now, again, where you're like, that, that is not good. That is a, a, a bad habit, or that is a, a bad thing I have allowed to come into my life that is hurting my walk with God, that is marring my testimony, that is taking me uh, farther from the presence of God. Um, this is an ongoing thing. The world is going to try often to creep back into our lives. It's why every year the Israelites did this, to, to sweep out the yeast. Um, Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven. during communion, he says, So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. So we're going to do that now here in a second. Um, the kids have prepared communion for us, and we're going to examine our, our hearts. And we're going to encourage confession to one another. We're going to encourage forgiveness with one another and strengthening of the body. And we're going to lay down anything that might be trying to take over that place in our lives that is meant for God. Before we do that, I'm going to bless you. And again, I'm going to remind you, worship this Wednesday. I can't tell you how excited I am about that. I believe God is, is going to be all over that night. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he turn his face towards you and give you peace.